Hey, this is Leif Ganford. I played the cash register thief in The Amazing Spider-Man, and you're listening to the Everything Geek Podcast. Hey, this is Rich McDonald, and I play Commander David Mason on Call of Duty Black Ops 2. And you're listening to Everything Geek Podcast. Hello, I'm Simon Fisherbecker. You probably know me better as Dorian Moldavar from Doctor Who, or the Fat Friar from Harry Potter. And this is Everything Geek Podcast. Just hit the jackpot with the Everything Geek Podcast. Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Everything Geek Podcast. I'm your host, Rory. And joining me today is a very special guest. We have author Jay Bollenzinger, who is best known as the co-author of The Walking Dead novels, Rise of the Governor. The Road to Woodbury, The Fall of the Governor, and Descent. So, how are you today, Jay? I'm well, thank you. It's wonderful to be on the show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you join us, especially with Descent, of course, coming up very soon. Next week, I believe, is a, a couple of weeks from now. Um, yeah, the 14th, um, officially. Okay. But you know what? They, they're sort of like magazines. They usually come out a week or two before <laughs> the pub date. So, yeah, yeah, next week, you'll start to see him floating around. Yeah, and hopefully not too long after until it makes its way over the pond to me. <laughs> yeah. Right, well, I've, I've seen the whole, you know, the, the, the British editions. <clears throat> I love the British publisher, and I'm not just saying that to be self-serving and blow smoke. I really do. Tor does a great job in there. They, they, you know, they have a different package. They, <clears throat> they always have different graphics for the jacket, the book jacket and stuff. And they're really good. I, I'm fortunate enough to have been in this business a long time. I've had, you know, I, I had roughly 20 books published before I started with the walking dead about five years ago. And, um, and I, and I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have, you know, my, um, books, uh, translated and published in foreign editions. And, you know, there's usually a British edition and, and I've even been over there, um, to do publicity on a few of them. Um, you know, I had a, I had a book with Pan McMillan called Oblivion that I was really proud of. It was, it's, it's a, it's one of my straight horror novels, but I'm, I'm digressing. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I mean, that's really great. You know, that you've gotten to come over to places like Britain and all and do publicity and all that for books you've worked on. I think that's great. Yeah. yeah, and I and I I love the UK. I mean, you know, again, it sounds really fake and bogus, and like I'm giving lip service, but I really do. I, you know, I was just talking to a, a Brit about this the other night. You know, I I just I feel like I could live there. I just love the culture. I love you know putting in a hard day's work and then stopping at the pub on the way home. <laughs> I can very easily fall right into that working class culture. I love it. Yeah, that's great. So getting right into the questions, Jay, my first question for you is, how did you decide you wanted to become an author, how to, to write books and novels? Um, you know, I, 
I get asked this occasionally, and um, I have to confess that it probably goes back to the day that I first laid eyes on Rod Serling on television. Rod Serling, for those listeners who might not remember him, because I'm going to date myself probably several times during the our, our chat, which I always do. But, um, and, you know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. And um, Rod Serling was, was the host of a show called The Twilight Zone. And he was the most badass, cool-looking dude that I had ever seen. The first time I saw him walk out with his black suit and, you know, skinny tie and thin lapels and he's smoking a cigarette and, and you know, he's got that Kennedy-esque hair and he's got that great, rich, stentorian voice. I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be whatever he was. I mean, you know, I wasn't even, I didn't even know at, the, at that moment that he was a writer, but as soon as I found out that he was a writer and a really good one, an award-winning writer, I, I, that's what I wanted to do. And I've wanted to be a writer ever since. I'm, I'm very lucky that I, like, I got to do as an adult what I always wanted to do as a child, but it had nothing to do with writing. It had to do with clothes. It's what I'm saying, Rory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty interesting, though, you know, the way you got into writing because of something else that you've been following up. That is pretty interesting. Um, yeah, so moving on to my second question, how did you first get involved with The Walking Dead novels? Well, um, I really was... Uh, yeah, a beneficiary of a classic kind of Hollywood, uh, uh, me, you know, confluence of events or coming together of, of two artists because it was literally the old cliche. My manager, uh, is a buddy of Kirkman's manager and, um, Kirkman's, um, producer and, and slash, um, manager is a guy named David Albert. And he, um, he said to my, um, manager, Andy Cohen one day, you know, we're looking for a novelist. You know, anybody, you know, any novelists, you hang out with novelists, don't you Andy? And he's like, what kind? And they said, well, some, an, you know, preferably a horror novelist. We're, we're thinking about, you know, moving the, the, the franchise into prose, into, you know, literary realms. And, you know, I, so the minute Andy called, I, 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 I wanted to do it and it sounded juicy and fun and sounded like something I, I should do, but I had no idea, no idea what it really was. I mean, I had read a couple of issues of the comic book at that mo moment. This was about 2009, like late 2009. And, um, the show had not come out yet. The show had not premiered on television. Um, you know, there was no video game. It was basically just a comic. And, you know, I figured, well, it's, it's certainly going to be like a uh, novelization gig. It'll be, you know, I'll get a script and they'll just want me to novelize a script. You know, which is, I mean, I have nothing against that. I, I've done that in the past and it's decent, honest work for, for a novelist, but it's not considered, you know, um, the highest uh, echelon of creativity. Um, basically, you're just sort of filling in the blanks of a screenplay or a teleplay or a video game script for a successful franchise. And then, you know, they can just sort of benefit from it in another market. But this, the, you know, I, luckily, flash forward, I get the job. And I, th I think there were reasons I got the job. I think I wanted it more and more. And I kept calling Andy back and saying stuff like, because there were like four or five other authors vying for it. But I kept saying, all right, tell Kirkman that I have George Romero's number on my speed dial. Just, just tell him that. George Romero is a friend of mine. See if, see if that makes any difference. <laughs> <laughs> um, which was true. You know, I worked with Romero. I, you know, maybe that had something to do with it. Um, but when I finally got the job and the first time I talked to Kirkman, I said, uh, so you're going to send me a script? And, um, he said, no, 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 no. That's, that's not what this is. This is, this is, 
you know, these are going to be full blown, original, serious novels. And I was like, really? And, you know, th- you know, hence this amazing experience began in earnest. I mean, you know, the first novel, as you mentioned <clears throat> in the setup was um, the rise of the governor. And, you know, it was an incredible experience just to get inside the head of this character and, you know, go through these permutations from, you know, the sort of kind of arch villain of the comic book and try to put, you know, flesh it out a little bit, put flesh on the, on the bones, you know, and, uh, it was just really fascinating. And that's way more, um, information than you probably even wanted, but <laughs> there you go. No, I'm always looking for a lot of information. It's not a good story otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And seeing as you're well, don't worry, course, I'm you always, know, I'm always... a good story. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it's just, it's really, you know, a huge part of my life, my, my career, my creative life and my passion. You know, I, once, once I heard I was vying for this job, obviously I went out and I read everything I could possibly get my hands on. I read the, all, all the issues of the comic, you know, I read everything I could find. And the more I read, the more I loved it. And I loved the comic. I just, I fell in love with the whole mythology and, um, you know, it's been going strong ever since. I think it was only up to about 80 or 90 issues at that point. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a fabulous um, source uh, for the franchise and all, all, you know, the whole industry that's grown up. The comic book still is just sturdy and venerable and continues to delight people, I think. Definitely. I completely agree so moving on to my third question, what is it like working with Robert Kirkman? Uh, well, you know, in a weird way, he reminds me a lot of Romero. Because I worked with Romero on a project called The Black Mariah. And this was back in 1992. And it was one of the films that, that George Romero got involved with and developed and he even co-wrote the screenplay with myself and another guy. And, um, it never got made into a movie. It went into turnaround, um, as they say in Hollywood. Um, but it was really one of the great experiences in my career and it was eerie. It was almost spooky when I started working with Robert because he reminded me so much of Romero. They're, they're both physically similar. You know, they're big, sort of bears with beards and they look like, you know, they could chop down a tree, (laughs) you know, they're both sort of from the Midwest. Um, you know, Romero from, from, uh, the, the working class, Northern part of the Midwest, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and, uh, Robert Kirkman from, um, the middle South of the United States, Richmond, Kentucky is where he grew up. And they both were very sort of, um, uniquely down to earth, uniquely down to earth. They, they just, they didn't, neither one of them suffers fools. Well, you know, they just want to get the job done and then go home, you know, and have dinner with their family. They just are really no nonsense people. And I really enjoy working with both of them. Um, Robert also, <laughs> He's he's really got a sort of uh, just a bone dry sense of humor, and um, and he you know he, he's 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 funny. I mean he's funny in a very droll kind of way, um, which comes out in his writing. I think. Um, and you know one more thing I'll say without rambling on too much about this, <clears throat> Robert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Robert has a reputation for, for like, like all really successful artists. Um, and he's, he's primarily a comic book writer. I mean, yes, he's the executive producer and creator of the show along with Frank Darabont and various, you know, the showrunners that have been involved and he's, you know, in charge of all the mediums, really, he oversees everything, but he's, he's really 
at his at his core a comic book writer, and he's he's very very generous in terms of how he um, talks about his collaborators in the media. He has mentioned you know numerous times that you know Jay Jay basically writes these novels. You know I I I just sort of you know look at him when he's done, and he, he's very really generous about that. The first uh, four books. It was supposed to be three, but then the third book, The Fall of the Governor, uh, became a two-part, you know, two-volume book. Um, the first four books, Robert would give me an outline at the beginning of the process on each book. And it was only, you know, like eight or ten pages. And it was in Robert's typical, inimitable style. He would just go, all right, Jay, here's, here's how it goes. Uh, the characters start here. And then this happens, and then there's a bunch of blood, and somebody dies a horrible gas with gas. You'll figure it out. And then they move to the next city, and and it's sort of like it's sort of like that, you know, uh, el- elemental or you know, that sort of sparse. And then finally, after the fall of the governor, we were sort of off the comic book page. We had sort of gone to a point in the novels where we kind of reached the end of what's in the comic book in terms of Woodbury and Lily Call and the people that the novels have sort of revolved around, Bob Stuckey, you know, these characters. So Robert, and again, being so, you know, cool with his collaborators, he just said to me, Jay, why don't you, the next, you know, the next contract we have is for four more books. Why don't you just basically write the four books? I'll just, you know, I'll just take a look at them when you're done. I may not say anything, you know, but why don't you just come up with the plots and and write the books on your own? I remember saying to him, I remember saying at one point, I remember saying, Robert, you have a reputation, you know, in the business for being kind of difficult, you know, kind of a dick. And I don't find that's true at all. You're like a, you're, you know, you, you, you're like a pussycat. You're like easy to work with. And <laughs> it's just a slighted pause. And he says, <laughs> he says, well, if I didn't like what you were doing, I'd be the biggest dick you've ever worked with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is an old on Robert Kirkman. <laughs> yeah. So it's just as well you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Knock on wood that I keep I keep it up. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, especially with you pretty much I get as you were saying, you're pretty much, you know, doing that on I guess on your own. Now of course he's gonna look over and approve at the end, but now it's you have a bit more control over these next four that you did with the previous four. Would I be right in saying that? Well, I, I think it's I, you know, it, I do. And, and, you know, for a while I was a little nervous. I was like, wow, I got the keys to the family car. I better, you know, be careful. I better look both ways. I better stop it. You know, come to a complete stop at stop signs. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, but, but now that I've finished one and it's coming out um, and I'm starting on the next one, I, I feel like an actor. This may sound strange, but I feel like an actor that has slipped into a role and they are playing the role in numerous sequels and, you know, series, you know, each, each week or each month or each year, another one comes out. I feel like an actor that's kind of slipped into Robert's mythology. And I feel like I've absorbed it on some kind of strange cellular level. Um, because in the early days I would say, Hey, I got a great idea. What is, what if we see this next scene through the point of view of a zombie? And what, it'll be like strange and trippy. And you know, Robert's like, uh, no. Good idea, though. Excellent idea. Uh, but no, we don't do that in The Walking Dead. Either. Okay, you know, and I'm, I was constantly like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that reminds me, actually. Do you have time for one quick, funny side story? Yes. Uh, we have time for all funny side stories. <laughs> okay. One day, a couple of years ago, I think it was on Rise of the Governor, but it might have been on the road to Woodbury, the second book. But it, at, w- at one point, 
the manuscript was done, and and we're and and the British publish, publisher um, is preparing to to publish it in the UK, and um, and the British editor. Um, I won't mention any names, um, not that I'm, I have something bad to say about them, but I won't mention any names. <laughs> the British editor uh, sends an email to Macmillan, the American publisher, and they're supposed to you know, pass it on to us, Robert and myself. <laughs> and, um, and it says, I notice on page 57... There's a um, reference to a bunch of undead uh, walkers being inside a church together for many months. And I'm just wondering, um, wouldn't they eat themselves? And <laughs> I, I was <laughs> I, for a minute, I, I kind of chuckled. <laughs> and then I'm like, uh, wait, uh, oh, my God, did I screw up? Did I mess up here? Oh my God. And I started freaking out. Like, did I make a huge mistake? And, and of course, Robert doesn't get involved in a lot of this stuff. You know, he's so busy. He's the rock star. He's, you know, we didn't hear from Robert for like weeks. And I got back to him and I said, you know, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I don't think that happens. I don't think it happens in the walking dead mythology, uh, uh, you know, most importantly, but I don't think it, it, it happens in Romero's, you know, um, in Romero's world, his milieu, I don't think that stuff like that occurs there. They sort of, you know, they don't go for dead flesh. Um, but I'm going to have to defer this to Robert, you know, and <laughs> we're waiting and we're waiting like weeks go by. It's like two or three weeks go by. Finally, this little email comes through from Robert Kirkman copied to everybody in the, in the loop. And all it says it's like one sentence. It says, zombies don't eat each other. Next question. <laughs> well, that took care of that pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sounds, sounds like Robert Kirkman. It's an uh, it's, uh, answer without an explanation, so to speak. <laughs> you know, works. I mean, before... Before I started working with Kirkman, I, I, I harbored many of the same sort of, uh, I don't know what you would call them, beliefs, um, philosophies, uh, just sort of norms yeah, and mores of is zombies. A good word. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, Robert is sort of a Romero zombie guy. He's not, he's not, you know, He's not against fast moving zombies, you know, he'll he'll tell you, you know, well look, if the fast moving zombie is scary, then fine, just so it's scary. But I but you know, I think in his heart of hearts, he's the slow moving zombie type of guy. And I was before I started working with him. And now that I work with him and his 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 zombies, especially the the, the, the Greg Nicotero zombies that are uh portrayed on, on the television series on the series. Um, those are strictly Romero-esque zombies. In fact, they're almost more Romero-esque than Romero's. They, they almost go back beyond Romero into the EC comics, like Bernie Wrightson type of zombies, you know, which I love. And I, I tell people in interviews, and I get asked this occasionally, um, fast moving or slow moving. And I am strictly a slow moving zombie guy. I don't think the yeah. metaphor itself works quite as well with a fast moving, you know, I mean, I, I love 28 days later. And I, you know, I, I, I love Danny Boyle. I think, it, I think it's, you know, I think World War Z, the movie was even entertaining, but I don't think those are zombies. Those creatures, they're, they're, they're different. They're monsters. They're, you know, they're not the archetype that I work with in the books because I, I think it only works if you can pretty much outrun it. If you're fast enough, you can, if you haven't, you know, you do enough cardio, you know, and you're in, you're in good enough shape, you can pretty much outrun a zombie or block it out of your yeah. home with a few, you know, good, you know, sturdy pieces of two by four plywood, you know, but if, but like every incessant problem in life, 
like like a like a small lump under your skin, like a like a, a one missed rent check, like one degree in your credit rating, some little small incessant problem. If it gangs up, if it swarms, if several months go by with you know delinquent bills, or or you or you get a you or your your the lump is malignant, you know it can. It can um, destroy you. It can cause mayhem, just like a horde of these slow-moving zombies. And I think that's why that's how the metaphor works for me. Yeah, I completely agree. Like I always see it as more, you know, in the walk in the Walking Dead, Renny, you know, world with slow-moving zombies. You know, if they're gonna get you, you know, it's gonna be a gang of them rather than just a cell zombie because you can easily, you know kind of get away, kill, whatever, one zombie if it's on its own. But if you're against a group of them, then you're better off just trying to escape than trying to fight them off. Exactly. Exactly. Well put. I mean, the way I look at it is it, it allows you to create set pieces, uh, you know, that are uh, kind of fascinating because if a slow moving zombie can surprise you. It can, it can pop out of some place you didn't expect it to pop out of, or, you know, they can fall through a ceiling that collapses or something and, and land on you. There's a lot of, there's great bits of business, so to speak, that you can do with them on the page or on screen and which actually is probably, you know, a, a, a part and parcel with the fact that they are a creation of movies, not of the page. Like, like you know, some of the great horror archetypes, vampires, you know, man-made monsters, um, you know, you name it, um, you know, werewolves. They're, they're the creation of literature. They originally came from, you know, let's say like the Victorian novel. But zombies, the Romero-esque zombie, not the, um, you know, the uh, Haitian, uh, you know, somnambulant zombie, but the, but the Romero zombie, the, 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 you know, the crawling out of the graves, you know, in, in rampaging in the, in the shopping mall, you know, that's a creation of motion pictures. And I, I think that's one reason why you can't think of a zombie literature classic we, do, we really don't have a dracula in in this in this in this um you know sub genre yeah yeah i completely agree moving on to my fourth question which were your favorite characters to write about in the walking dead novels if you had to choose well you know i used to <laughs> that's a good question because when I first started out, I had a very um, sort of adolescent longing to write about Michonne. Michonne was, she was the, you know, ultimate badass, you know, hardcore, um, tough as nails woman. And, you know, the ninja, you know, take no prisoners. And she was mysterious. And, you know, the way she's introduced in both the comic book and the television show is, is super cinematic and kick ass. Just an amazing sort of walk on where she's, you know, she appears with her, you know, kente sword and her, you know, her pets with their, you know, jaws removed. And, and I, so I, I long to write about her. Now, eventually I did get the opportunity and I wrote about her in both, um, the fall of the governor part one and the fall of the governor part two. And it was really fun. And, you know, Robert Kirkman even called me one day before I started on those books. And he said, good news. I'm like, what? And he goes, you're going to, I thought he was going to say, I'm going to give you a raise, but no, he said, <laughs> anytime your boss is good news, you, you think you're going to get a raise. And he said, you're going to get to write me Sean. Finally. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my God, that's sweet. But the reason I bring all this up as sort of a, a preamble is I have sort of fallen for 
Lily Call as probably the greatest character and most fascinating character I've ever written as a, as a writer. Um, she continues to evolve in really interesting ways. And she's sort of taken on a, a sort of a life of her own. Um, as I think readers of Descent and um, the next book after Descent, which I'm just starting on now, um, which I think, here's a scoop for you, I think it's going to be called Invasion. Um, you know, she just becomes... Yay, free scoop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, that's just from me to you, Rory. That's, that's a little gift. Nobody, nobody knows that. I mean, that's brand new. I haven't tweeted that or anything. It's just, um, and, and it's sort of not completely decided yet. Robert hasn't written off on that yet, but that may yeah. be what it's called. It's um, like a provisional yeah. title. Right, 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 <laughs> right. But, um, yeah, but Lily is, um, you know, she's, she's an amalgamation of, you know, many uh, character traits that I, that I admire in a, in a character. She's complex. She has flaws, and yet she's um, the first one to dive into a swarm of zombies to save a child or, or you know, um, stand up for somebody who's honest in her, in her town. And she's the first one to, you know, run into the burning building. And yet she's riddled with phobias and, and, and neuroses and, She's, you know, also she's just beautiful and um, strong and sexy, and she is kind of modeled after my wife, I, I have to admit. And my wife's name is Jill, and I call her Jilly, and I called her Jilly <laughs> long before I started writing Lily Call. So, yeah, so anyway, that's, again, that's another long answer to your <laughs> simple question. <laughs> No, I like that. It's pretty interesting, especially, you know, the whole wife reference. That is pretty cool. <laughs> you know, it's funny because there's a, the, the American edition, the American edition of um, The Fall of the Governor Part 2, the hardcover edition, um, and, and, you know, the trade paperbacks, they have this woman on the cover who's obviously Lily Call. And she's she's kind of standing there with her back to to us as we look, you know, upon over her shoulder at this you know sort of ravaged town, and she's got like a, you know, she's got like a like a you know nine millimeter Glock in her in in her hand, and and she looks like she's either just you know, um, you know, wiped up the streets, or she's about ready to you know take down you know a dozen, you know, Walking Dead. Um, and just her shape, just the way she's shaped and her posture, and everything looks exactly like my wife. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah. And yeah. Jilly, you know, Jilly comes to the conventions with me, and she she revels in it. She enjoys, she loves The Walking Dead. She's a big fan of the show. Um, you know, she, she reads all the books, obviously, because I force her to. Um, I stand, you know, stand over her as she's reading it and no, I'm just kidding. But, um, yeah, yeah, she, she, she sold, she, you know, she owns it. She's proud. And Lily, the character of Lily call has actually appeared in the show in season four, um, under a different sort of guise, which, which really yeah. speaks to, I, I think of it as the calculus of Robert Kirkman's experimentations in all the genres there's kind of a strange unique calculus going on where where many characters appear they'll cross over from one genre to another they'll they'll come from the comic book and then they'll appear in the book or they'll come from the book and they'll appear in the video game and yeah. you know and and then there are there are characters who are exclusive to each uh genre um, you know, Daryl Dixon, ex exclusive to the show, the TV show. Um, you know, uh, uh, Clementine, exclusive to the video game. Um, but they interact with each other, and they interact with, with crossover characters. And sometimes crossover characters survive in one genre and die in another. So it's truly impossible to really know what's going to happen. And I think that's the whole... Uh, 
impetus behind it. I think it's just simply because Kirkman does not want people to second guess, know who's going to die and when, or what's going to happen with any single character. Definitely, yeah. My fifth question, did yourself and Robert ever discuss what happens to characters that we don't see die in the novels and their fates are left unknown? For example, April and Tara Chalmers, because in The Rise of the Governor, you know, Tara kind of kicks the governor uh, out of the apartment after the incident with Philip. <laughs> I'll just call yeah, it that. That's a, yeah, yeah. That's an excellent, excellent question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. Um, yeah, to be honest with you, you have hit on the exact um, sort of prime directive that I have now with these next four books because Robert and I discussed, you know, who, who is it, where, you know, what part of the mythology, what part of the story in the comic book and in the book do, do, uh, have we sort of left, we have sort of departed from, we've left like the Chalmers sisters, you know, like, you know, like April and, in, in uh, Tara, um, who have we left? And we really don't know what happened to them. And Robert said, you know, the big, you know, the big question I think in many fans mind is whatever happens in Woodbury, you know, what does, does, you know, does Lily take over, you know, what happens after, you know, the, the big uh, confrontation at the prison and the governor is killed. And then, oops, that was a spoiler. I hope <laughs> I still, I still have to stop myself, you know, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, um, then what happens in Woodbury? And, and I said, you know what, that could be the whole arc of these four books. Um, it could be just terrifying and interesting and like almost like a tiny little sort of mythology unto itself, you know, the Woodbury Chronicles. And, and, and Robert's like, you know what, let's do that. That's the only directive from me, you know, just, just make sure that this sort of tells us what happens in Woodbury after, you know, the fall. So that was, that was, yeah. So your question sort of um, kind of gets at that. And that was our motivation for these next four books. Yeah. Just saying, but once you've done with Woodbury, you should definitely write books for April and Tara, because they're definitely two of my favorite characters in those books, and you know I want to find That's out really what happens cool. to them. <laughs> to well, me, I bet, I bet you yeah. were, I bet you were, um, I bet you were kind of fascinated by how they were incarnated in the TV series. Like you know, April, April Chalmers did not appear in the TV show, but a family appeared who had a daughter named Tara and who had a father who was, you know, dying of emphysema. And so they were kind of an in, in incarnation, but April became Lily, Lily call. Yeah. And, you know, at the time, the governor, if you remember, you know, the governor was on the road and, and kind of, uh, you know, fell in with them and kind of fell in love with, with, um, with, eight, with Lily. Um, yeah. That was a completely, genetically modified version of, of the Chalmers. What you may have noticed is that in the TV show, their surname is Chambler, where in the books that you wrote, their surname is Chalmers, so very similar names. Right, right. But by design, I think, they're, I think it's a wink and a nod yeah. to readers of the book. Um, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the comic book and in the series, much of the series, these characters have no last names. So yeah. even even the governor had no last name in, in the in the comic book. And so, you know, five years ago when I started working on this, I'm like, well, the governor and his brother, you know, Brian, um, they're gonna have to have a last name. And Robert's like, why? I mean, they don't in the comics. I'm like, yeah, but, but in a, in a book uh, for me, prose, like, you know, fiction, um, 
you almost are obligated to give main characters a last name unless you are really trying to do something stylistic, you know? Um, but I said, let, let me try, you know, let me try to come. He loved, you know, he, I, well, I say he loved, I mean, you know, Robert doesn't like, you know, get goo goo eyed over anything, but <laughs> he thought Blake. That would you know, be a Blake sight was, to see. <laughs> that would be a sight. Talk about ghastly horror. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, um, but you know, he, he liked Blake, and, and, I, and I'm like, oh, I'm glad you like that, because I do, you know, I spend, like, way too much time, probably, an inordinate amount of time thinking about last names for characters in my books, um, even in my, my standalone books, in my original books. Um, you know, the character names are really important to me. I admire books where the characters have names that are completely sui generis, completely original, like, you know, Hannibal Lecter. You know, these names stick with you. They, they have subtext. They have, you know, meaning beneath the surface, and, and they, they, they have a sound. That, and I just thought Blake... Blake, you know, maybe was partially a Thomas Harris illusion or, you know, the influence of Thomas Harris, who's one of my favorite authors. Um, but, you know, going back to, you know, the, the visionary artist and poet, Blake, but also it, the sound of it um, sounds dangerous. It's not Blake. The word Blake sounds like it could cut you, you know, so. That was that became the the Blake brothers, and for Lily, the, another one of the main characters, um, her last name is C A U L, and that uh, in 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 um, the vernacular, uh, 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 you know, mostly around the South, is the membrane, the amniotic sac that surrounds an unborn child. And, you know, that was, I thought that would be a really cool name for her because she is kind of born into this heroism, you know, that she gets involved in. Um, and a lot of the characters had no last names like Bob. Bob was, you know, he became a main character, you know, a, 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 an important supporting character in the comic book. Never had a last name. Um, Stooky was my name that I gave him in the book and that ended up in the series. Um, a lot of the stuff from the book bleeds into the series. No, no pun intended. Um, you know, there's a scene in the series with David Morrissey and Andrew Lincoln and they're, they're sitting down at a table. It's like the first real face off of the two characters. It's really, it's a showdown. There's like a gun underneath the tabletop and you know, you have no idea what's going to happen. And, um, and the governor launches into a story of his wife's death. And that came from my book that came solely from my book. And, um, you know, so, so, I mean, that's one of the most gratifying things is that everything is, is fair game in Robert Kirkman's universe, you know, in his writer's room at the show, they're, they're like, they're like, uh, they're almost like, you know, they're, they're almost like, um, electronic music, you know, composers or, or, you know, DJs, like they sample everything and, and they sample the Chalmers family, but they may speed it up. They may slow it down. They may just collage it in there strangely, you know, and it's going to be, I can also tell you that maybe this is another scoop. There's going to be a lot more of this. Um, coming up in, in season five. Wow, that's pretty. Uh, it, that is pretty interesting. And yeah, you know, I actually think I have to go back and read the books again now that you mentioned the idea with the gun under the table. Which book was that in? No, so that's, I feel like that's I in the series. It. It's in oh, the series. Yeah, but I thought you said that was an idea from you that was put in the series or something that you know. No, not the not book. the actual fact that they were sitting at a table, ah. but it was um the the uh anecdote that the governor in the series tells that that David Morrison oh. tells. He tells yeah. an anecdote about the death of his wife. Yeah. Sorry, I got confused there. That's yeah. all right. That's all right. 
But, you yeah. know, when you write this stuff, you write this stuff, and then about a year later, you're sitting on your couch with your wife watching a show, and it's echoing something you wrote a year earlier. <laughs> it's very cool. It's very, yeah, that's it's very pretty gratifying. exciting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is. It yeah. is. It is. Yeah. Yeah, and well, and it'll definitely be great to see more of that in season five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you will. I happen to know, you know, I'm not allowed to say what it is, but I, I'm telling you, there's going to be a lot more sampling going on from all the from all the mediums. So everyone, you've got then two weeks until The Walking Dead season five premiere. Read all four of Jay's books by then. Then you might have an idea which scenes, you know references books <laughs> yeah <laughs> and if not you're probably gonna end up clueless <laughs> yeah so moving on to my sixth question what can you tell us about the new novel descent which will be out very soon on october 14th yeah well thank you for asking of course i'm very it's like really my you know uh my first uh solo um, effort in the world of The Walking Dead. Um, I almost feel like this. I feel I feel like akin to Scott Gimble, who's the um, head writer, you know, the showrunner, um, with the novels. Um, I'm really sort of running the writer's room of the novels, so to speak. Um, and you know, I've gone through the process on one, and it was um, probably the best. Uh, experience I've ever had with a book. I, I know a book, let me put it this way. I know a book is special or, or at least, you know, minimum, I know a book is working. If I sit down to proofread it and I get caught up in it, you know, if you, because you know, I mean, I've taught r r fiction writing over the years occasionally and um, I remember, you know, always being uh, flabbergasted by my students when I asked them, have you sat down and read your novel from page one to the end straight through? What? Yeah, I mean, it's a simple question. Have you sat down and read your own novel from page one <laughs> to the end straight through? They're like, well, no. Who does that? <laughs> I would. I love reading novels. Yeah, yeah. Well, I do too. I do too. And I think that's that that happened to me on Descent um, as I was, you know, proofreading it. And I just really sit down in a quiet place. I go to the graduate stacks at Northwestern and, uh, University, and I, you know, I just and I just spend like eight or eight or nine, ten hours sometimes. I just go from morning to night on a single day, and I read the whole thing straight through. I I have to do that to know if. You know, the rhythm is working, the, the pacing. Um, you really don't know what to cut out or what to leave in unless you do that. Um, if you read it in fits and starts, it's, it's harder to, to get a handle on that. And, you know, part of my process personally is I look at, I look at writing fiction as um, similar to writing music. You know, it has, to, it has to have a beat you can dance to. It has to, it has to flow, and it has to sound right to your inner ear, you know, and I just got caught up in, in dissent. I, I had, you know, I'm really, I, I, I think it has something to do with the fact that Robert kind of cut me loose from the comic book panels, which I'm not, that's not to denigrate the comic book, obviously. Um, it, it's a great, you know, um, example of, of that, um, medium you know it's one of the greats in, in graphic novel um history you know and i love it but when you're sort of going back to it on a regular basis and keeping the timeline straight and retelling things that have happened in the comic book from a different point of view you are kind of encumbered or at least you're sort of tethered to that and when he cut the tether and just sort of let me loose like, like a dog that he had kept in a you know kennel and he just lets this dog loose. I mean, I was so excited and it shows, I think in, in the book, the way it reads, there's more cliffhangers, there's more, you know, um, action. It's, it's just, I really am proud of it. I'm, I'm, you know, 
I almost have to temper what I say about it because many of the fans already know that it's, it's, it's the first solo book, you know, it doesn't follow the comic book anymore. Um, in fact, that we went through this entire, again, <laughs> you are the first, um, and I'm not saying I do a lot of these, but I do quite a few of them. You're the first interview, the, the, the first podcast I've done um, on this stage of the Walking Dead books, on this new era. So you're getting a lot of scoops. Like, you know, I'm probably, you know, uh, I'm probably speaking out of school in, in, in when I say some of these things. But Robert, again, Robert is very cool about being upfront and honest about how these things are created. And, um, you know, I mean, I, 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 um, imbued this one descent with more of my tricks and my bag of tricks and stuff that I know because I felt emboldened. Robert allowed me to do it, you know? And so, yeah, I could go on and on about this one. It's, it's, it's a, it's sort of, um, it's kind of, uh, a, um, I would, I would call it horror action. I guess I, I would have to say it's more horror action. Um, or it tips the scale toward action, um, which is kind of what I specialize in. Um, you know, the first book I ever published was called The Black Mariah, and um, it was the book that George Romero um, attached himself to and uh, adapted with me. And it was basically the story of um, two itinerant truck drivers, long distance, long haulers who travel back and forth across the United States delivering, you know, um, produce, you know, to grow to, uh, grocery wholesalers. And in the deep South late one night in the dark of night, they come across, uh, a hapless individual who's been infected with some kind of illness or sickness. And it turns out it was a curse and they are infected with the curse, the two truck drivers. And they learn that the curse an ancient curse which prevents the, those infected from coming to a stop. If, if you become motionless while infected with this curse, you will get violently ill. And if you stay motionless, you'll burst into flames. And so this was, you know, my first attempt at a long form horror work and it was all action. You know, it was, they had to refuel themselves while in motion. They had to, uh, (laughs) anyway, I'm not doing a commercial for my first book, although you can uh, (laughs) order it on Kindle or any form, digital format. Um, but, (laughs) but, um, but yeah. And while we were working on it, I'm, I'm kind of digressing a little bit, but while we were working on it, because descent kind of reminds me of the feel of this, this piece. Um, you know, it's my firstborn too. I mean, I, I, I wrote it in, you know, 1990. Um, you, you, you hope that you're a better writer, but also there's, there's a love of your firstborn, you know, uh, transcends everything. I go back and look at it and I'm like, yeah, it's overwritten. It's very purple. It's very, you know, um, wordy, but I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really fun to read. Um, there's something nostalgic about it. Yes, you're absolutely right. There is a nostalgic aspect to it. And, um, and yeah, you know, I remember when we were working on it one day at Romero's house in Sanibel Island, Florida, um, his producer was working with us and, um, the other writer, Preston Whitmore and I were sitting there and we were taking notes and George was going through the story and the phone rings and, um, the producer, Peter Grunwald picks up the phone and, you know, he's, he's, I hear him talking to somebody and he goes, no, nope, nope. Haven't heard of it. No, don't know anything about it. What's it called? Mm, Nope. I don't, I don't know. And I'll have to ask these guys if they've heard of it. All right. I'll talk to you later. Goodbye. And click, he hangs up. And then he looks at us and he goes, there's this project in development over at Paramount it's called speed. Has anybody heard of that? You know, and, I, and none of us had heard of it at that point. And he goes, well, the bad news is it's about a bus 
that has a bomb rigged in it that won't allow the bus to come to a stop. You know, and it's an action, you know, vehicle film. <laughs> I should have known the minute I heard that, that our project was doomed. You know, we we <laughs> kept working on it. it was, originally, it was on the fast track, you know, at, at New Line Cinema. And, you know, basically within a couple of months, it was it had stalled because of speed. Speed had beaten us to that perpetual motion uh, movie. So anyway, I mean, again, it's a digression, but but that that's you know this this is descent feels like um uh, you know a new chapter in my work, and and I hope that people you know feel that when they read it. Definitely, I mean that's obviously pretty exciting, yeah. So my final Very. question, yeah, my final question for you, Jay, is. Do you, of course, we all know about Descent, which is an upcoming project, which is out very soon. But do you have any other upcoming novels or other projects you would like to talk about? Well, um, yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, <laughs> you know, when one thing is when you're when you're a career writer and you've been doing this as long as I, and and you're you're you're, uh, you know, fortunate enough to be, um, you know, regularly published internationally, you always have something in the works. It's like an, a busy airport. There's always ideas that are circling the airport that, you know, you have to land sooner or later and you're kind of in the control tower. Um, so I have had this, this one idea for a long time and I've been developing it for years and it's finally going to come out. It's, it's being published by a, a, uh, a small um, boutique a division of Simon and Schuster called permuted press. And um, it's a, um, it's, it's a supernatural horror novel that um, takes place in the world of dream mechanics, dreams. And it's called lucid. And it's called Lucid because it's about lucid dreamers um, who are, as you probably know, there, you know, a lucid dreamer is a dreamer who knows they're dreaming when they dream. And because they know they're dreaming for one reason or another, and there's a lot of ways a lucid dreamer can learn that they're dreaming, they control their dreams. So, you know, it's um, it kind of, that's kind of the takeoff point. That's where it, it begins. And, um, yeah, and so that comes out in January of 2015. That's pretty exciting. I mean, it obviously must feel great when it's something you've been working towards for a long time and you now it finally exactly. you know, it gets green and now you know where it's going to be coming out. That must feel really great. Yeah, it does. I mean, you know, I was, I sort of, it's doubly sweet for me because I, I was sort of in the throes of trying to finish it when I got the walking dead job five years ago. And, um, I got to know the people who produce the walking dead series pretty well. Um, it's a company called circle of confusion and they're really cool people and they develop really cool material and they, asked me what I was working on other than The Walking Dead. What else was I working on? And I told them about Lucid. And they loved it. And, you know, I'm hoping that we can revisit it and go back to it because maybe they'll get involved with the screen version of it. Who knows? But they were really interested in it. And I knew I had something. So I, I really kept working on it whenever I had an opportunity, which wasn't very often over the last five years because Kirkman just kept me, you know, <laughs> spinning Busy. out these Walking Dead books. And, and you know, each book would, would debut on the New York Times bestseller list. And, and it became a huge priority and it became a lovely thing. And this is maybe a good way to, to end our, our podcast, at least my part of it, um, by saying that I get asked by people all the time um, at conventions, uh, um, you know, on the street, uh, in interviews and stuff. And they ask me similar questions. They always say, do you, do you long 
to go back to your original material ever? You know, do you do you miss those days when you were working on your original novels? And and my answer is always the same: not at all. I don't long for that at all. This is this gig that any author has ever had, and I will defend that to my death. I am so lucky to have fallen into this honeypot, <laughs> the Walking Dead. And really, say that sincerely, if, if you, you know, anybody familiar with my backlist, with with my catalog of stuff that I've written, would understand where I'm coming from because I feel like I have been working toward this, um, this project, this continuing project, of working, you know, on the Walking Dead books, uh, my whole life. From the time that I saw, you know, um, Night of the Living Dead in 1968, I was nine years old, and I snuck into the theater in, in Peoria, Illinois, the Palace Theater, <clears throat> and little did I know that when I was bit with that bug back then, I, I loved it, and I was terrified by it, and I went back to see it immediately. Um, I Little did I know that was going to be my kind of my destiny. That was a... a a precursor really to what I'm doing. And I, I just, I, I, you know, people go, well, yeah, but don't, but aren't you, aren't you, don't you sometimes get frustrated that you're, you're becoming known as like the zombie book guy. <laughs> and I'm like, no, there's no frustration. I'm proud to be known as anything in this world. It's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's all of our questions to you, Jay. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you on the podcast. Back at you. Same, same here, Rory. It was, it's been really fun, and I, I appreciate you taking the time and, um, you know, um, giving me this much time. It was, it was really a, pl a pleasure. Yep. And thank you for taking time to talk to us before the release of Descent. And hopefully, we can talk to you again at some point, considering. I'm sure you have many more Walking Dead novels to come out in the future. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Every every time I work out now, every time I go to the gym and work out, I'm like, I got to stay healthy. I got like <laughs> 10, 10 more Walking Dead books to write in my life. <laughs> I have to stay. <laughs> or maybe if, if we do have a zombie apocalypse, I'll be able to outrun them. <laughs> yeah. That would be interesting, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully we'll talk to you soon then. I I look forward to it, Rory. Thank you yeah. again. Yeah. Talk to you soon then. All righty. Bye. Bye-bye. So that was a great interview with author Jay Boninzinger, our first author guest on the podcast who told us, quite a bit about The Walking Dead and the upcoming novel, Descent, which comes out October 14th. Make sure to buy it or pre-order it online, you know, as Jay suggested. It's going to be great. I mean, the ones he's released before, uh, the Governor ones, very interesting. Um, they were great novels. And, you know, and one of the things, of course, he was saying that's very interesting is, of course, the fact that it's, I guess you could call it more unique now in the sense that you know with the previous ones you had to make sure it stayed true with the comic timeline and all that but now it kind of is you know he can just do he has more free reign you know to where with where he goes with it which is what i'm one of the things i'm most excited about with descent and his other upcoming walking dead novels so yeah so time to wrap up so make sure to check out our youtube channels the podcast is www.youtube.com slash user slash everything geekcast. Mine is www.youtube.com slash user slash separatist destroyers. Check us out on Twitter, twitter.com slash everything geek. Check out Jay Bonanzinger's website, www.jaybonanzinger.com. And check out channel 1138 podcast live from www.channel1138.com. So geeks there, everyone. <laughs>